Hello everyone. Um, I hope you're doing well. Today I want to talk to you about this book, Fear and Loathing Las Vegas, A Savage Journey into the Heart of the American Dream. It was written by Hunter S. Thompson, a self-proclaimed doctor of gonzo journalism in 1971, still fresh off the fumes of the summer of 69, the hippie revolution, but it's not quite yet in the punk era, and it shows in the themes of this book. The story of this book follows a journalist named Raoul Duke sent to Las Vegas to cover the Mint 400 bike race uh, and a district attorney's drug conference. He drives to Los Angeles with his Samoan lawyer and bodyguard, a character who's not named in the entire book, a six-barrel magnum and a trunk containing two bags of grass, 75 pellets of mescaline, five sheets of high-powered blotter acid, a salt shaker full of cocaine, a half galaxy of multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, and laughers, also a quart of rum, a quart of tequila, a case of Budweiser, a pint of raw ether, and a dozen amyls. This drug frenzy trip into Las Vegas uh, to cover these two stories is used as a narrative to talk about many, many more smaller side stories, like one where they pick up a hitchhiker who doesn't speak and jumps out of their car, another one where they collect $200 from a pig woman in, in Los Angeles or buying an ape from Vietnam War veteran. These, these smaller side stories, they are all the individual stories and they all add up together to build the core theme of an exploration of the American dream in the Nixon era. The reason why Raoul Duke should cover these two conferences for a theme, thematic reason is that for the Drug Commission, he considers it to be a corrupt game, quoting, it had been a waste of time, a lame fuck around that was only, in clear retrospect, a sheep excuse for a thousand cops to spend a few days in Las Vegas and lay the bill on the taxpayers. Nobody had learned anything, or at least nothing new, except maybe me. They are still burning the taxpayers for thousands of dollars to make films about the dangers of LSD at a time when acid is widely known to everybody but cops. He, he adds, he considers this to be a greater theme in the general corruption that was around in Nixon era America. I mean, the president himself was corrupt, so uh, what can you say? The reason why I picked the mid-400 race is to tie in the themes of the American West and the road, one core part that built the entire idea of the American dream to begin with. But what is the American dream? I mean, this book considers itself to be a dark, psychedelic look into the American dream in the Nixon era. But what is it? The American dream in the beginning was the idea of social mobility and opportunity. It was that anyone can move to America, and since there was so much land, they can make a life for themselves. This was very attractive to Europeans at the time. When you look at the Irish, German, and Italian migrations into America, you see that it always comes after a time of hopelessness of horrible economies or droughts or famines where people really need this hope. This idea of social mobility and opportunity over time has developed into a twisted version of itself is the argument that this book makes. It has become a sort of celebration of excess where instead of moving from poor to a, a decent life, it, the goal is to move from poor to so rich that nothing matters, even the government can't stop you. It's this kind of neo-libertarian mindset that was very big in the latter days of the hippie movement. When you picture sex, drugs, and rock and roll and, and libertarian excess, you picture Las Vegas, a city of barely any regulations and an industry that profits from addicts. And they go there high on basically everything just to experience everything hedonistically. And this hedonism, when you read it, it, it starts to slowly feel like a grotesque celebration of excess for, for the sake of excess. And you really see and and yeah, towards the end of the book, towards the end of the book, Thompson kinds of towards the end of the book in a paranoid episode, Thompson makes a rant about the post '60s burnout era, right before the punk movement kicked in, and the general atmosphere of America at the time in late day Nixon, and 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 his disillusionment of the traditional American ideals and the American dream itself. And I'd like to read that section to you. Indeed, but what is sane, especially here, in our own country, in this doomstruck era of Nixon? We're all wired into a survival trip now. No more of the speed that fueled the 60s. Uppers are going out of style. This was the fatal flaw in Tim Leary's trip. He crashed around America selling consciousness expansion without ever giving a thought to the grim meat hook realities that were lying in wait for all the people who took him too seriously. After West Point and the priesthood, LSD must have seemed entirely logical to him. 
but there was not much satisfaction in knowing that he blew it all so badly for himself because he took too many others down with him. Not that they didn't deserve it, no doubt, they all got what was coming to them. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. But their loss and failures are ours too. What Tim Leary took down of him was the central illusion of a whole lifestyle that he helped create. A generation of permanent cripples, failed seekers who never understood the essential old mystic fallacies of the acid culture. The desperate assumption that somebody, or at least some force, is tending that light at the end of the tunnel. This is the same cruel, paradoxically benevolent bullshit that has kept the Catholic Church going on for so many centuries. This is also the military ethic, a blind faith in some higher and wiser authority. The Pope, the General, the Prime Minister, all the way up to God. One crucial moment of the 60s came that day when the Beatles cast their lot with the Maharashi. It was like Dylan going to the Vatican to kiss the Pope's ring. First gurus, then when that didn't work, back to Jesus. And now following Manson's primitive instinct lead, a whole new wave of clan-type commune gods like Mel Lyman, ruler of Avatar, and what's his name who runs the spirit and flesh. Sonny Barge never quite got the hang of it, but he'll never know how close he was to a King Hell breakthrough. The Angels blew it in 1965, and the Oakland-Berkeley line, when they attacked on Burge's hard hat con boss instincts and attacked the front ranks of an anti-war march. This proved to be a historic schism in the then rising tide of the youth movement in the 60s. It was the first open break between greases and long hairs, and the importance of that break can be read in the history of the SDS which eventually destroyed itself in a doomed effort to reconcile the interest of the lower working class biker dropout types and the upper middle Berkeley student activists. Nobody involved in that scene at the time could have possibly foreseen the implications of the Ginsburg cursey failure to persuade the Hells Angels to join forces with the radical left from Berkeley. The final split came at Alamot four years later, but by that time it had long been clear to everybody except a handful of rock industry dopers and the national press. The orgy of violence at Alamot merely dramatized the problem. The realities were already fixed. The illness was understood to be terminal and the energy of the movement were long since aggressively dissipated in the rush of self-preservation. I picked this section out because I thought it described, the, the, it described that era very well, right after the hippies, right before the punks. A general sense of, of dread and Cold War nihilism that plagued America in this turbulent era where the optimism is gone but the anger isn't there yet and in this context is this new twisted version of the American dream extremely visible and that argument is exactly what uh, Hunter S. Thompson is trying to make. One interesting aspect about this book I think is the, is the how the story is told because the story of Raoul Duke is one story but at the same time there is a parallel story that happened for real of Hunter S. Thompson and his Mexican lawyer who also went to Las Vegas in search of the American dream. If these two stories interweave with one another between the real of Hunter S. Thompson's journey and the fictional of Raoul Duke's journey. This kind of stream of thought writing style that blurs the line between real and fiction is, is, is a very poetic, where thoughts come and go in a very natural way. And the, and the general surreal, hyper-aware environment that this book describes through Raoul Duke's ramblings, puts you in a hazy mindset, almost like a drug frenzy that Raoul Duke himself is on. The paranoid way of the stream of thought puts you in the head of Raoul Duke himself. The random use of air quotes in this book that start at random and don't really end, or end at random at places you don't think, adds to this sense of unrealness, where you don't even know what the people are saying or if they're even saying anything. So certain questions he asks in the book is almost objectless in that he asks himself these questions, at the same time asking the audience or and in certain parts it feels like he's speaking directly to you without him actually speaking to anyone. This interwoven style between real and fiction is also called gonzo journalism or novel with key where it is a real story with a fictional presentation. Like in this book there is the real trip that they took and there are images of it and then there is the fictional version with Raoul Duke and the Samoan. One interesting this book is at some point it reveals the key by completely removing the fiction aspects from one chapter and just leaving in the raw original recordings from his trip. This makes it clear to the reader that there is two stories going on, a real and a fictional. 
And to fully understand the book, you have to understand that there are two stories. So by breaking it, he makes it clear. Another name for a novel with key is then gonzo journalism. The word gonzo comes from French-Canadian slang meaning the shining path. So, so the shining path of journalism. This genre, is often, this genre often has traits of first-person perspectives and a mix of real and unreal narratives. It can also be called subjective journalism. To quote Hunter S. Thompson himself on why he writes in this gonzo style, he says, objective journalism has let America be corrupt for so long, and you cannot be objective about Nixon. Gonzo authors consider subjectivity to be their main tool in, in that their subjectivity in their books can paint life's very subjective experiences very realistically, more than of an objective experience. For objective, for objective writing has the tendency to dull down the emotions and the truth of the scene. Gonzo writers also believe in a general absurdity of life, in that trying to emulate this absurdity in a non-absurd objective way is impossible, and that a fictional subjective narrative can often feel more realistic than an objective one. Gonzo journalism has had a big resurgence in recent times, with works like Borat, where Sasha Baron Cohen poses to be a Kazakh journalist investigating the American ideals, and in turn reveals how the average population will turn a blind eye to bigotry and, and racism. Um, something like this would not have worked with objective journalism. The reason why people in Borat are so open to accepting bigotry is because they think they're talking to some strange foreign Kazakh journalists. Recently, in the Trump era, which has many parallels to the Nixon era of a constantly lying criminal president running the free world, gonzo journalism has made a big comeback with works like Borat 2 and All Gas No Breaks. These two works tries to attack Trump's and Trumpies' rejection of truth and facts and their general disillusionment with news and the entire journalistic industry by making them feel like these people are just listening to them and, and understanding them. Borat 2 follows Borat as he goes to um, All Life Matters rallies and follows QAnon believers around and anti-vaxxers. By giving them a platform, they speak fully free about themselves and in turn reveals the genuine absurdity and stupidity that their ideologies harbor. All Gas No Breaks is a project from a Portland journalist who considers himself to be a direct disciple of Hunter S. Thompson, where, where he goes to um, what he calls classic Americana, like events like, again, all, uh, Proud Boys rallies, uh, the riots in Washington, or the demilitarized zone in Portland, and basically almost every major rally and, and, and riot that happened last year. He, w he goes there, and he goes there and gives these people a platform to talk about what they're doing and their ideas, and he just holds the microphone to them and doesn't speak and let them talk, and then edits the video. So there's this true narrative of the, of the, of the interview and then the edited fictional narrative, that, 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 kind, that tries to paint the characters that exist in the modern day American landscape and also tries to show the dissonance that exists in America nowadays between Trump's radical right and the, and the general center and radical left and the split that's happening. Um, I really recommend this book to anyone who is interested in reading something that is weird, fun, and just simply unique. Um, it doesn't feel like any other fictional book I've ever read or any other non-fictional book for this blend in between um, evokes an experience that of, it own, of its own. This is a Leo recommendation. In case you have any questions, feel free to ask me through chats or whatever. Have a nice day.